Hello, my dear students. How are you? I hope uh, all of you are doing fine. For today, we will be discussing another lesson, which is all about the origin of the first life forms, the classic experiments on the evolution of life. Before we proceed with the discussion for today, I would like to say thank you to Sir Raymond Ledesma for allowing me to use this PowerPoint presentation. I just added some information that I think will be useful in our discussion. Our first topic is all about the introduction to life sciences. So, competencies are the following. So, the first one is to explain the evolving concept of life based on the emerging pieces of evidences. And second one is to describe how unifying themes in the study of life show the connections among living things and how they interact with each other and with the environment. We are done discussing lesson number one, the historical development of the concept of life. Now, we're going to discuss our second lesson under this topic, which is all about the origin of the first life forms. Lesson number two, the origin of the first life forms. Objective is uh, to describe the different experiments that explain how life forms emerge from different conditions. Let us have a recall of our previous topic the historical development of the concept of life. So, with regards to that, we now know that life started billions of years ago, so a few million years after the formation of our planet or of the planet. And life started as very simple form under the harsh condition of the planet. Whereas um, the first living organism or the organism that was formed is known as the prokaryotes. So again, what are prokaryotes? Prokaryotes are the unicellular organisms that lack organelles or other internal membrane-bound structures. Therefore, they do not have a nucleus but instead generally have a single chromosome. So when we say chromosome, it is a piece of circular double-stranded DNA located in an area of the cell called the nucleoid. And then last one, we know that evolution took place until the simple organisms became more and more complex. Let us try to do this um, short activity wherein, as you can see on your screen, we have here a puzzle. So you're just going to find the words in the puzzle. Words appear straight across backward straight across up and down down and up and diagonally so you're just going to look for the words that you think are associated or related with the topic to be discussed for today so i will be giving you two minutes to comment down your answers all the words that you see in the puzzle you're just going to comment down to type in your answer and then uh, you're going to write also or to add your name and your section that will serve as your attendance for this class.
Okay, so now is time's up. So here are the words that you can found in the given puzzle. So let us read the words. So we have abiogenesis, biogenesis, broth, experiment, Francesco Reddy, John Needham, life, Louis Pasture, maggots, and Spallanzani. So all of these words has a relationship with the topic that we're going to discuss for today. Humans have been asking for millennia, where does new life comes from? Religion, philosophy, and science have all wrestled with this question. One of the oldest explanations was the theory of spontaneous generation, which can be traced back to the ancient Greeks and was widely accepted through the Middle Ages. In line with this, let us watch a short video clip explaining spontaneous generation. Prior to Charles Darwin, scientists had some rather strange ideas concerning how life began. They believed that living organisms came into being rapidly and spontaneously over a period of just a few weeks. The scientific community believed in spontaneous generation for 2,000 years. And it is a stark reminder that even a majority of scientists can be wrong. In his classic 17th century description of spontaneous generation, scientist Jan Baptist von Helmont suggested that mice came from dirty underwear. Wanneer je een stuk gedragen ondergoed, if you put a piece of sweaty underwear in an open mouth jar, together with a piece of wheat, after 21 days, the ferment coming out of the underwear changed the wheat into mice. But what is even more amazing, is that the mice are not small or aborted mice, but adult mice emerge. Another evidence offered for spontaneous generation was the rotting meat experiment. 17th century scientists observed that if meat was placed in an open jar, maggots formed on the meat weeks later. They conjectured that life, in the form of maggots, arose spontaneously from rotting meat. But in 1668, Francesco Reddy an Italian physician and scientist overturned this idea. He suggested this proof of spontaneous generation was nothing more than contamination of the meat by flies. When flies landed on the rotting meat, they laid their eggs. Over time, these eggs grew into maggots. Later, the maggots changed into flies. When scientist Reddy prevented flies from landing on the meat with a piece of cheesecloth, maggots never formed. Based from the short video clip, Aristotle is a Greek philosopher who believed that with favorable environment and forces of nature, life can come from non-living materials. Aristotle is a proponent of the abiogenesis theory or also known as the spontaneous generation in which the idea of spontaneous gener generation is that uh, life could appear from a non-living material. Aristotle was one of the earliest recorded scholars to articulate the theory of spontaneous generation, the notion that life can arise from non-living matter. Aristotle proposed that life arose from non-living material if the material contained pneuma, which means vital heat. 
As evidence, he noted several instances of the appearance of animals from environments previously devoid of such animals, such as the seemingly sudden appearance of fish in a new puddle of water. When we say puddle, P-U-D-D-L-E, it means a small pool of liquid, especially of rainwater on the ground. So in Tagalog, we can say na lubak siya or lubak sa sahig na may tubig. Based from the... This theory persisted into the 17th century when scientists undertook additional experimentation to support or disprove it. By this time, the proponents of the theory cited how frogs simply seem to appear along the muddy banks of the Nile River in Egypt during the annual flooding. Others observed that mice simply appeared among grain stored in barns with thatched roof. When the roof leaked and the grain molded, mice appeared. John Baptist von Helmont, a 17th century Flemish scientist, proposed that mice could arise from rugs and wheat kernels left in an open container for three weeks. In reality, such habits provides ideal food source and shelter for mouse populations to flourish. Let us observe and analyze the different experiments done by the scientists in understanding life's origin. Kindly answer the questions that follows. So on the screen, we have the illustration of Francesco Redis experiment. A sealed flask, a flask covered with gauze or cheesecloth, and an open flask. Question number one. How do you describe the existence of maggots or life forms in each setup? In sealed flask, in flask covered with gauze or cheesecloth, and in an open flask. And then question number two, according to spontaneous generation, life may emerge from non-living materials. Does the sealed flask setup follow this principle? Why do you say so? In 1886, Italian physician Francesco Redi conducted an experiment to challenge the idea of spontaneous generation. Redi was able to prove that organisms do not just come to life spontaneously. What was Redi's experiment and what did it show? Reddy went on to demonstrate that dead maggots or flies would not generate new flies when placed on rotting meat in a sealed jar, whereas live maggots or flies would. This disproved both the existence of some essential component in one's living organisms and the necessity of fresh air to generate life. Reddy's hypothesis suggests that flies lay eggs that produce maggots, thus refuting the theory of spontaneous generation. What Let us observe and analyze John Needham's experiment. What does the heating or high temperature do with the microorganisms in the broth? If the organisms die due to the heating, why does the third setup has microbial growth? Does John Needham's experiment coincide with spontaneous generation of life? In 1748, John Needham, an English priest and biologist, challenged Reddy's experiment. He tried to prove that spontaneous generation can occur in an appropriate condition. He noted that heat could kill organisms, even the smallest ones. When the broth was boiled, all organisms in it had died from the heat. 
Days later, he noticed that a thick solution had formed on the broth. His own experiments in which he daily boiled broth infused with plant or animal matter, hoping to kill all pre-existing microbes. He then sealed the flask. After a few days, Needham observed that the broth had become cloudy and a single drop contained numerous microscopic creatures. He argued that the new microbes must have arisen spontaneously. In reality, however, he likely did not boil the broth enough to kill all the pre-existing microbes. Observe and analyze Lazarus Palanzani's experiment. How is Spallanzani's experiment different from Needham's? Does Spallanzani's experiment prove or disprove the spontaneous generation idea of the emergence of life forms? Kindly elaborate your answer. Lazarus Palanzani did not agree with Needham's conclusions, however, and performed hundreds of carefully executed experiments using heated broth. As in Needham's experiment, broth in sealed jars and unsealed jars was infused with plant and animal matter. Spallanzani's result contradicted the findings of Needham. Heated but sealed flask remained clear without any signs of spontaneous growth unless the flask were subsequently opened to the air. This suggested that microbes were introduced into the flask from the air. In response to Spallanzani's findings, Needham argued that life originates from a life force that was destroyed during Spallanzani's extended boiling. Any subsequent sealing of the flask then prevented new life from the entering and causing spontaneous generation. Observe and analyze Louis Pasteur's experiment. After the broth was heated, did microbial growth happen in the setup with long curved glass neck? Why do you think there is no microbial growth in the setup with long curved open glass neck? What happens when the glass neck is cut? How will you explain Pasteur's experiment in connection to the spontaneous generation idea? The debate over spontaneous generation continued well into the 19th century, with scientists serving as proponents of both sides. To settle the debate, the Paris Academy of Sciences offered a prize for resolution of the problem. Louis Pasteur, a prominent French chemist who had been studying microbial fermentation and the causes of wine spoilage, accepted the challenge. In 1858, Pasteur filtered air through a gun cotton filtered and upon microscopic examination of the cotton, found it full of microorganisms, suggesting that the exposure of a broth to air was not introducing a life force, but the broth would rather be with airborne microorganisms. Pasteur made an experiment to test the idea that a vital element from air was necessary for life to emerge. He boiled sugar solution with yeast in flask with long neck. Through heating, he eliminated the contaminants. The flask was left open to allow this vital factor in the air to enter, but no organisms developed in the mixture. It was because the microorganisms settled only on the bottom of the curved neck of the flask and could not reach the mixture.
let us have the summary of our lesson for today. The theory of spontaneous generation states that life arose from non-living matter. It was a long-held belief dating back to Aristotle and the ancient Greeks. Experimentation by Francesco Redi in the 17th century presented the first significant evidence refuting spontaneous generation by showing that flies must have access to meat for maggots to develop on the meat. Prominent scientists designed experiments and argued both in support of John Needham and against Lazarus Palanzani's spontaneous generation. Louis Pasteur is credited with conclusively disproving the theory of spontaneous generation with his famous one neck plus experiment. He subsequently proposed that life only comes from life. Thank you so much for attending my class today. And I hope that you have learned something. All the pictures and ideas used in the PowerPoint presentation are credits to the rightful owner.